It wasn't always one nation under WWE. For decades, the pro wrestling landscape operated under a system defined by territories. The word territory was used to describe an individual pro wrestling promotion. Each territory was defined by informal boundaries and in most cases run by a single promoter. You had like uh, approximately 30 or 40 wrestling territories at one time in North America. And the reason it was so successful is because the guys that had the that owned the territories and ran the territories had the only game in town of that genre. They had no competition within the genre of pro wrestling. And when there's only three TV stations in most markets, they had the world by the short hairs. Right here, the $100,000 challenge match. Each territory had its own stable of talent, stars who could fill arenas and draw viewers on local TV broadcasts. Many of wrestling's biggest stars emerged from the territories, like Hulk Hogan of the AWA in Minneapolis, Bret Hart from Stampede Wrestling in Calgary, and Ric Flair in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in Charlotte. And up in the Northeast, there was the World Wide Wrestling Federation, or WWWF. This territory was run by Vincent J. McMahon, father of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. In 1982, the younger Vince McMahon bought the company, by then renamed the WWF from his father. McMahon's goal? To make the WWF the premier pro wrestling promotion in the United States and later the world. Here's what he told Sports Illustrated in 1991. In the old days, there were wrestling fiefdoms all over the country, each with its own little lord in charge. There were maybe 30 of these tiny kingdoms in the US, and if I hadn't bought out my dad, there would still be 30 of them, fragmented and struggling. I, of course, had no allegiance to those little lords. So without allegiance to the other territories, McMahon began his quest for domination, and he quickly realized the key to his eventual victory, Cable. In 1983, McMahon made a deal with the USA Network, which put the WWF on the national stage. No one had any idea of cable TV was coming out. They see that show in LA, they see that show in St. Louis, they see that show in Minneapolis. Wow, what is that kid Vince McMahon doing? He's ruining us. And I'm going to tell you something, they hated him. But the talent loved him. Popular wrestlers began to leave their territories for the WWF with promises of increased exposure and bigger paydays. When the territories were out of business, they stopped developing new stars, they refused to change their ways of how they promoted, and they, they self-destructed. And of course, the big man comes along with a big vision, and he helps to facilitate their becoming irrelevant by creating competition in the marketplace. And the reason that a lot of the wrestling promoters think McMahon is the enemy is because they didn't, they didn't like competition. But McMahon would soon have some competition of his own in the form of media mogul Ted Turner. In 1988, Turner acquired Jim Crockett Promotions, which oversaw valuable promotions in the central states, southeast, and mid-Atlantic territories. This acquisition resulted in Turner's National Promotion World Championship Wrestling, or WCW. By the 1990s, WWF and WCW were the only two national promotions with sustained momentum. The two companies were embroiled in a bitter battle during that decade, in a period known as the Monday Night Wars. WWF, which eventually became known as WWE, prevailed, and Vince McMahon bought WCW in 2001 for a mere $4.2 million. And today, WWE is a billion dollar company with millions of fans around the world. Some smaller promotions exist, but there's no denying that WWE is the biggest show in the world. And Vince McMahon remains the king of the pro wrestling universe.